Hello and welcome to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan and we are here to advance out of the Stone Age, out of the Neolithic, and into the mighty and amazing Bronze Age. It's our first step into metalworking and all the consequences that come with that, including faster production, faster growth periods, uh, quicker elimination of forest and thus more agriculture can be developed quicker and many 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 more developments that come about because of that including what will become obvious in trade and what will become obvious in changes in burial practices and i hope you look forward to this as much as i do as we talk about this very important and very interesting subject so when did the the bronze age happen well I can say this much. I think, first of all, we can actually say that Bronze Age actually began with what I would call the Copper Age, because initially you didn't really have bronze tools. It was, the initial shift was actually more into copper to start with. And as we shifted from bronze, uh, because of the durability that you get from alloying copper with tin, uh, then you get a complete change in the way we do things, the way things are produced, and the way human beings are able to create for themselves uh, a, a much better and more efficient way of doing certain things. So where does this all begin? Well, around 3000 BCE, advanced cultures in the Middle East, Africa, and in the Greek mainland and islands, uh, like the Mycenaeans, Minoans, those kind of people, uh, they begin the process initially. It comes originally out of the Middle East, spreads to other areas. Of course, Egypt had been using gold quite often. Uh, in this period and obviously we know well they have a lot of gold deposits and a lot of access to that but as we're going along we get this great development into the Bronze Age and with it uh, things like armor become metal uh, we get swords we get all sorts of things that weren't really that useful before in the Stone Age and we also get specialization because the ability to smelt uh, copper is in, and tin into bronze is not something that obviously just anybody would know, and it would have to be taught to them. And likely the other thing we get, um, which doesn't get talked about as much, is probably things like slavery, which may have existed in the Stone Age, because we end up needing a workforce to do some of the dirty and terrible jobs, which we'll talk about some of that as well. Uh, however... That's in those places. Now, as for the British Isles, they don't see bronze for almost another thousand years. Now, there's a big debate in the archaeological community as to when exactly it arrived in Britain. As early as 2500 BCE has been mentioned, and as late as 2000 BCE is mentioned. So effectively, what that would mean is from the Near East to Britain, it took a thousand years for, or at the very earliest, 500 years for this technology to make its way to them. So that means likely what you had, you have a couple things probably going on there. One, because of the advantage it would give people militarily and in production wise against their neighbors, there probably wasn't a lot of sharing initially. And as it kind of got out, it was slow moving. And and the one thing we see in, in this age before writing in Britain, but also across the world, is that things move at a much slower pace until you have an ability to educate the population in more than just words. And I think you can see how that affects things because it's very difficult to pass things on by anything other than oral tradition. And so to try and pass on technology and achievements takes that much longer. And then as well, of course, and like I said, the likelihood of communities and nation states being really wanting, you know, the competing neighbor to have what they have becomes a question as well and so for many reasons things just don't progress the way they do now where you have a global reach so information spreads so very quickly by comparison um, so likely what happened is we have a, a probably a two-prong thing probably drives bronze into Britain one as we know Britain is actually 
and we know this because enough archaeological evidence has been made about it, and we even have some writings about it, there was a suspicion that Britain had a lot of precious metal, and specifically that it had the access to uh, bronze. And where this came from initially, we don't know. There was a Greek writers that have talked about uh, the fact that there was precious metal in Britain, uh, but that was much, much later. This is more that was more in the Iron Age as opposed to the Bronze Age. But it also probably is what brought the Romans over investigating things and trying to conquer Britain. So there's a tradition of it. Now, where would that tradition have begun? Likely from trade, because, of course, one thing that happens in this era is you're going to be trying to shift goods about. You're trying to trade for other items, luxury items, uh, tools that you might want to use. And so as people spread into other regions and see what the other regions have, there's a desire to bring it back home, just like now, right? You go to, say, Japan, you might find something really cool and interesting that you see, and you think, gee, that'd be nice if we had that where we live, and you bring it back with you. Well, that's no different, you know? A tourist is a tourist is a tourist at the end of the day. And so the other option may have been is that we see a population coming out of Europe and moving to Britain, and likely that's also true, be it through intermarriage, be it through slavery, be it through conquering. We don't really know. We know there's a massive sea change in this, the way certain things happen in the Bronze Age in Britain, but the reality of it is we don't fully understand how it happened. It may have been a cultural change, like, oh, hey, our neighbors over in France, look at what they're doing. Wouldn't it be cool if we copied them? Sure, let's do that. And so, or this is way more efficient than what we're doing back home, you know. And so you would find that people would either make changes to their lifestyle or possibly there would be groups that would come over and through dominance in some way or another show their advantage or show their advancements and become either in charge or become the specialists that are brought over to teach the locals how to do it. So, how do you end up finding bronze? How do you end up making it into something that you can actually use as a weapon? That's one of the things I think we'll talk about today is how that process begins. Because I think it's important to understand why it would happen because it, it wouldn't be an obvious thing, at least initially, you would think. But from the process, the, the two major things are you have to be able to find a source of this. Now, one of the ways you do that is by being able to observe the landscape. And as you observe the landscape, you'll notice a change in color patterns on rocks specifically, uh, even in dirt to a lesser extent. And you can actually see that if you look at like cliff faces and such, you'll see changes in colors because of different uh, eras and kind of as the environment changes, you get a different impression on it. So at times, what you also get is you get an impression of, say, deposits of things like in where I grew up we had a, a coal mine at one time so even today as you drive through the area and drive through what we call the coolies which is basically an, the indent from the river valley uh, as you drive up from the river valley you see seams of coal still sticking at the edge of these these mounds um, and they're still easily accessible more easily accessible than I think a lot of people even realize now, comparatively, in the Bronze Age, you have people going around and they're not looking for coal, although they might be. They're looking for copper and they're looking for tin. And they will see those deposits on the surface, know that if there's a deposit on the surface, likely there's going to be more. And then they would start chipping it away, probably with initially Stone Age tools. And they would chip out the shiny or rusty looking segments of rock. And then they would do they would go through a sequence of things in order to actually process it. So how do you process this ore that you've chipped out? So what initially, as I said, you find highly colored carbonates, uh, copper and shafts. So effectively what happens is you find it on the surface, then you start to dig in and you find more and more and more and more and more until you've run out. Typical mining process, except for it's a lot less tedious than it would have been now to try and find it because now we're having to dig a lot farther in order to track it down. 
the difference is, is, of course, you don't necessarily have light as you dig into holes. So it becomes very difficult to actually go into some uh, mines because you're doing it in the dark. Thus, the reason why there's some question of whether or not there'd be slaves involved, because it's a miserable process. Now, maybe they just got paid more. It's hard to say. Whatever that pay would be, I wouldn't even begin to guess. Um, but likely you would do it through slave labor. It'd be a lot easier on you, for one. And two, you don't have to worry about them. And unfortunately, sadly, uh, in slave labor, they didn't really care about your well-being too terribly much. And this is the case. And largely, now, where would you get slaves? Uh, typically, what happens is you get slaves through battling the next door neighbors. Um, because, of course, you don't have prisoners of war. You have... Oh, I caught you. You gave up. Well, you shamed yourself or whatever. So now you're a slave you, until you either work off your penance for being caught or losing or you stay this way for the rest of your life. Or you earn enough money to pay your way out of it, which is another option that comes about eventually. Now, whether that always existed or that was always the process, I couldn't say. But just our understanding of slavery, that seems to be how the conditions began and sort of how the conditions continue. And then it becomes a genetic thing where you're just born in slavery because you were a slave. Um, and your parents were slaves and you were always slaves. And yeah, that's where institutional slavery comes from. And it becomes much more difficult to get out of it, as we've seen, you know, obviously in more recent times in the United States. So anyway, going back to the, the process of gaining bronze. So once you've extracted, extracted the copper, you then crush that rock with a fine powder or to a fine powder. Then you mix it with charcoal and possibly iron ore flux. Uh, that prepares it as an ore. Then you place the ore and fuel in a clay lined hearth. So what happens is, is you cannot smelt something without containing it in something else because typically open flame would not get hot enough because the big thing is you've got to get it really hot to, to melt metal. Metal doesn't melt at normal levels of say cooking a, a roast would be, right? Like we cook roast at about 300 to 350 Fahrenheit, maybe 375 depending on what it is or 400. Well, for bronze you've got to get it to 1100 degrees celsius uh which is a lot higher in fahrenheit and so the only ways you can do this is to effectively first of all contain the fire and then heat it superheat it through blasting air in to give oxygen at a very fast very consistent and more importantly at a huge rate which then fans that flame. But if the flame's contained, then it's not as, the heat isn't escaping, which is the big key. So what they would do is, first of all, you have this clay-lined hearth. Then you have a bellows that they've built, and that would help it, or even a natural uh, condition of wind, where you would create a way for the wind to come in a bit uh, more focused, I guess would be the word I would use. So you'd have a much more focused set of breeze that would come in. Probably in all likelihood that was how it early happened, early on happened before they got to the point where they were able to invent bellows. Uh, then you basically allow everything to melt up, and then as it cools, you extract the raw copper from the bottom, because now what we've got is we've got a raw copper which is completely separate from the rock that it was in when it was ore. Then you remelt the copper to purify it again and prepare for casting, and then you hammer and reheat the copper to prepare for metal tools. That's how you get what amounts to the first stage of copper use. Uh, when you get to bronze, though, what you have to then do is you have to alloy it with tin or arsenic. And so everything is kind of that much more complicated and that much more time consuming. And you have to be really careful because you can mess stuff up. So that's, that's why I say it's a specialist process. You can't just kind of do it you have to know how it's done because if you do it wrong it doesn't work and th this is being probably made by people who've been making pottery which again needs that same sort of setup where it needs an enclosed space to heat things properly it has to be very careful because if you do it wrong the pottery breaks it's too fragile so there's lots of things that you have to take into account so you can see how that kind of background would make it easier for somebody like that to understand and be able to create something from copper 
into something called bronze, which then you could use to make tools, make weapons, make all these other things that sort of assist you in the production of these items. So if we go back to Wales and look, what we end up happening, have happening, is instead of, uh, whereas before we were talking about in the Stone Age, a lot of people live on the coast. They live in areas near the coastline because, of course, food sources come from rivers, come from oceans, come from what you can grow. And obviously droughts and other climactic effects would make things difficult sometimes. So obviously you need to supplement your food supply. And likelihood is because it takes so much longer to chop things down and clear, uh, you're likely not clearing as much forest as you might with metal tools. One of the big things we get with metal tools is sharpness obviously goes up quite dramatically. So now the weapons are way more efficient. The, the axes are way more efficient. So clearing agricultural space becomes a whole lot easier to do in the Bronze Age. And that helps because now all of a sudden you've got a much larger area of growing. Uh, it also helps because it creates the ability to make defensive fortifications that where you can be in the mountain ranges or in somewhere where it is heavily forested, clear out a, quite an area and then protect yourself a lot easier. And I think that's one of the things that comes of this is we start to see a much more complex system in the way people live. We start to get towards the roundhouses of the Iron Age. We get more towards the hill fort settlements we will see in the Iron Age. And that shows that A, people are needing to protect themselves, protect their families, protect their crops, protect their, their uh, sheep and cattle and pigs and chickens. And so there's consideration for why you would do that. And it's not strictly a religious reason. It's typically a defensive reason. That's If you look even later on in the period, uh, you end up having hill forts become terribly popular right up until the Romans come and basically show the Celtic Iron Age population that it, the hill fort doesn't stop them. After the Romans leave, however, and post that and the real Anglo-Saxon England versus the rest of Britain, uh, you have this point where the British population goes back to their, their Iron Age hilltops and resettle there. Basically because that's a that's an area of safety. It was proven. It it worked. You know, you can imagine some some old timer saying, Well, back in my day, blah blah blah. Of course back in his day was five hundred years ago, so eh, <laughs> maybe that didn't work so well. But you have this whole concept that the the get up on a hill, protect yourself, make your barrier easier to do, and then clear around you so you can see anything coming. And that becomes very common at the beginnings of this age of metal. And that's part of the reason why, because you can do things much more efficiently. Once you can do things much more efficiently, you're more willing to do it. And that will definitely change what we understand and, and what we see in the in this age of bronze. So one of the big mines that we have actually in Wales, and this is why I say you see a movement inland. One of the areas we actually find this mining going on is actually out of the uh, mid Wales, not too terribly far, really, from Aberystwyth uh, in Ceredigion. The interesting part to it is, is it comes into the mountain ranges. And having walked in this neighborhood, because I, I, I live briefly near Aberystwyth, and I actually lived back quite a ways, actually not far away from Strata, Florida, which is the, the old uh, monastery that was there, which we will talk loads about later. Um, I used to walk quite often there, and I can tell you that when you're out walking in that area, you realize very quickly just how hilly things are, because there's a lot of hills between that area and Aberystwyth proper. And the one thing that you can imagine as you look about is that it would be easy to notice copper deposits in this area because of the shale, because of the hills. There's a lot of silver, lead, zinc in this area. It's very popular even in Roman times. It becomes a, a mining area. Right up until the 1800s, they're still mining in the Victorian era. And the area we're talking about is a place called Cum Istwith. Uh, it's, it's in Keradigion, and it is something of a well-known place from historically going back even into the Bronze Age. And it was an, a, a place where we found copper 
and was definitely a historically well-known and well-used mining site. And like I said, when you walk around that area, you see the land, you can see there are mineral deposits even today that are actually visible on the surface. And so what you end up happening is you find that surface and then you can dig in. The other thing is, is that area is actually very pleasant as far as agriculture goes and ranching. Uh, even again, as I said, today there's a lot of sheep farm uh, ranching going on there. There's a lot of farms there. It's still a community where there's a lot of easy ability to grow things. And so unlike when you get into the, the very central part of Wales, or even if you go into North Wales, where it's a little more difficult because the the there's more mountain ranges and it's rockier this area is still easily agriculturally developed uh it has all of the advantages of being close to rivers is with obviously being in the name it's it's a very large river in the neighborhood and you have all of this access to arable land that you can use so all of that kind of makes it a great place for people to move to but you can imagine as they're moving into this, this is before the land mass is the way it is now. And so they're even moving more in land than what we think of, because really the land stretches farther out into the Irish Sea than what we think of, even in the Bronze Age. And so realistically, the, you know, they're really going in land. So you can also imagine that that would be quite the change from the staying near to the coast, staying closer to accesses to major water supplies staying closer to trade let's be honest so obviously then the rivers become very important and your ability to ship stuff out of there because obviously just mining in an area like that you would have access so if you have access then it gives you the ability to then ship it out to someone else whether that's someone else's uh, valley over or across the island or even overseas that part of it we're not clear on but the reality of it is this is when Wales really does get more settled. We start to see a lot more occupation. There's a lot more evidence of occupation. And we will continue to look at how the Bronze Age will affect this area, how it affects basically all of Wales, because it does develop the country in ways that weren't being developed before. And the Stone Age, of course, didn't have this option. It didn't have the ability to do this. Uh, at the time, agriculture is still relatively a new thing. Now, people know how to grow stuff. They know how to develop uh, arable land. They know how to... Domestication of animals has taken place for thousands of years. You know, everything that they needed to do to figure this out has already started and or been done. And now you have tools that will make things even easier. And yes, bronze is not iron. It's not steel. But yet it's still a million times better than a stone implement as far as being able to have durability because of course if something gets out of shape you can pound it back in if things get warped you can even go as far as resmelt them and make them into something new it's harder to do that with stone because obviously once you've chipped out a piece to put in an arrowhead you can't turn that arrowhead into another item it's just literally an arrowhead and once it breaks it's pretty much done so that's one of the big differences with bronze. This whole shift also allows changes in the way people live, probably because the efficiency of being able to create larger farms, being more effective at farming because you have a different type of implementation, uh, you end up having better yields. And if you have better yields, obviously people are healthier. And if they're healthier, then they will continue to grow as a population. Big, big step for the population of Wales is growing out of the initial stage and the only way you can do that is if you have an increase in arable land or in uh, act actual yield on a yearly basis because obviously at this time period people are completely dependent upon the land and what it can give from them still there is no sense of being able to mass produce things to the way even in the roman period they will be able to do and civilization has not stretched to a point where there is actual massive uh, civilized locations. We don't have towns and cities in this era in Wales or even in the main part of Britain. We have small villages, maybe, and likely we just have farmsteads here and there. And they're all linked familiarly. There's still that sort of 
tribal cultural links. So even though you're related by DNA, the likelihood is, is that one set of people living in a small valley probably saw themselves distinct from the people on either side of them. And just over the mountain might be such a strange population as to not really be recognizable. The Bronze Age starts to change things. It starts to create a more global community. But we're still at the stage at this point where people are learning about others. You know, you don't generally leave your community and go out and go wandering about as much as you would now. So you may have large portions of the community that have never gone past, say, a mile away from home. Whereas later on, that'll start to change. You'll get more shipping, more trade, more fundamental need for people to move around and so then you'll have changes in the way things happen but for the next couple of thousand years that's not what happens and people don't do that as much and the other thing is being on an island in Britain you don't have the pressures of tribes moving into your territory quite as much so you don't have the same sense of urgency because you don't ha you have natural barriers especially in Wales there's not only is there an ocean barrier but you also have mountains that you can go into and there's places you can hide from problems and then come back and deal with things so yes people might starve in that period but it's a heck of a lot easier to defend yourself than it is if you're on a plane in the middle of germany or france where you don't necessarily have that natural protection and thus as tribes are moving around for various reasons be it land be it agricultural need be it you know, they've got a drought and they're starving to death and they need to move somewhere else to get away from it. Or even just the case that, as we will see in other ancient communities, you have this dispossessed group which then moves out and effectively decides the heck with it. We're going to come back in and we're going to take away from you what you took away from us. And then there's this huge movement and fighting that goes on in the Bronze Age period. I would hazard a guess it's likely not as bad over in Britain. And, and a lot of the problems that happen in the rest of civilized, in quotes, Europe, probably don't happen in Britain simply because there's not that kind of development and it is not built to have a lot of people suddenly shift in and on it. You can't imagine massive amounts of boats crossing the English Channel to try and get into Britain and even less, you know, tribes and tribes of people pushing up against the British population the way they would do later. You know, at this stage, I would assume crossing the English Channel is still a bit of a dodgy process. And so you don't necessarily need to move that amount of population anywhere. So realistically, this is probably a good incubation period for Britain. But as I said, likely you do have some movement because you have this development of, of Bronze Age culture. You have a development of smelting and how to do it. And it isn't just coming in from Europe, it's being localized, the minings are being localized, the smelting's being localized. We have loads of archaeological evidence to show us this. And as we go, and as we talk about this in the next episode, we'll talk about how that affects everything to do with the way the culture of Britain looks at itself, what kind of archaeological deposits we'll find, because those will suddenly change. And more importantly, religious and ritual will change as well. And we'll start to see major changes in the way people are buried, in the process of burial, and more importantly, how monuments are created to those burials and to those ways of dealing with the dead. And again, we'll come back to Stonehenge because Stonehenge again becomes a big area as it continues to remain the center point for the faithful community and the ritual community. And it is, of course, the modern example we can look at, even though it's an ancient source. But keep in mind that what's going on at Stonehenge is probably largely going on across Britain, because we find evidence of henges, be it wood or be it stone, across Britain. And especially in Wales, there is large portions of this still going on. So this whole ritual period is still happening as we speak. And like I said, we'll go more into this as we get into the Bronze Age. I hope you'll stay with me. Uh, we'll probably do at least another episode, possibly two on this particular thing, because there's so much to talk about in the Bronze Age. And uh, thank you for joining me this week. Uh, please check out distractionsmedia.com. That is where we have all the various things that we do. It's definitely worth checking out if you'd like to follow some of the other podcasts we do or follow our videos on youtube.com forward slash distractions media productions, which we do pretty much a daily episode of something and we're also found on twitch at twitch.tv forward slash distractions media and we probably do about a weekly bit on there 
And if you could give us a review on iTunes and on Stitcher and on Google Play, those are very much appreciated. I really appreciate all your support, help, and advice. Please contact me at uh, the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. Uh, comments, concerns, suggestions, you know, criticisms, my pronunciation, uh, all are welcome. And I appreciate your continued support. And I hope this has been useful for you. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.